Welcome to Evaluating and Selecting Cultivars. This is an introductory learning module focusing on the basic considerations for selecting cultivars to grow. Selection of crops and specific varieties or cultivars that match site, production systems, and markets is one of the most important decisions a commercial fruit and vegetable grower must make. In this module, you will learn how to suit your growing conditions and market potential to the appropriate cultivar selection. Also discussed will be the resources for additional information on cultivars and how to conduct your own cultivar evaluations. Every farmer has to decide what to produce and two fundamental rules for long-term survival are selling quality and finding your niche. Before you plant anything, you should research your potential market. It is important to understand what crops are already being produced, in what quantity, and how they are being marketed in your area, and how your enterprise will affect and hopefully enhance that market. Remember, you do not need to grow everything you sell, but what you grow has to sell and be profitable. With the right products, customers, and skills, success can be found in locating niche markets and developing new products to satisfy them. Let's start with some terminology. Variety is a term that today is used interchangeably with cultivar, but is not technically correct. Plant varieties are changes or differences in a plant species that occur in nature through cross-pollination, mutation, and adaptation, not controlled breeding by humans. Brassica oleracea provides a good example of variety. The wild plant is a small biennial herb from the coastal Mediterranean region, overwintering as a rosette of leaves before producing a spike of a few yellow flowers at the end of its second summer before dying. Over the last several thousand years, several distinct lineages of Brassica oleracea have developed, each amplifying different parts of this wild plant to produce several vegetable varieties. For example, the leaves of kale, collard greens, and Chinese broccoli the terminal bud in cabbage, the axillary or lateral buds in Brussels sprouts, the stem in kohlrabi, and the flowers in broccoli and cauliflower. These varieties look dramatically different but are nonetheless considered to be the same species. As an additional note, catalogs will often use the term group when referencing a variety name, so instead of a crop grouping that reads Brassica oleracea italica, the heading would read broccoli or italica group. Like Brassica oleracea, Zia maize is another plant species with a number of distinct varieties. Rather than amplification of certain plant structures as seen in Brassica oleracea, the varieties of Zia maize differ mainly in the amount of starch each kernel contains. The term cultivar is a contraction of cultivated variety, meaning that humans selected the parents and made control crosses. Cultivar names are not italicized like variety names, but they are capitalized like proper names. They are also bracketed with single quotes and follow directly after the species and our variety name. Using the sweet corn example on this slide, we already know that sweet corn is a variety of Zia maize designated by the variety name rugosa, but is the cultivar name that follows that differentiates the type of sweet corn. As mentioned in the basic fruit production module, some plants are self-fruitful and some are self-unfruitful. Terms used to describe whether a plant can self-pollinate or whether it needs to be cross-pollinated an, by another species or cultivar for fertilization to occur. We also need terms to describe how pollination is going to occur. An open pollinated plant is one in which pollination is carried out by wind, insects, or other naturally occurring agents. The seeds saved from an open pollinated cultivar can be grown in subsequent years and will breed true providing it does not cross pollinate with another cultivar of the same variety or species. Catalogs designate open pollinated seed with an OP somewhere near the name or in the description. The converse of an open pollinated cultivar is a hybrid cultivar, which will be discussed shortly.
cultivar names followed by the descriptor F1 designates that seed as hybrid seed. F1, or first generation, does not mean genetically modified organism, or GMO, but instead refers to resulting seed made by cross-pollinating two specific parent varieties or cultivars. Although F1 hybrids often show increased yield and vigor, the plants will not breed true if its seeds are saved. Although there is no exact cutoff date, heirlooms in general are cultivars that have been in existence since before modern breeding or the development of hybrids, usually before the mid-1950s. The seed of these open pollinated crops have been saved for generations by growers and passed down through the ages, often with a family history or story. Although heirlooms do not in general provide the high yields, consistency, and disease resistance of hybrids, they do excel in a grand variety of flavors, colors, shapes, and textures. Although heirloom is a term generally associated with crops produced from seed, it and the term antique are also applied to older cultivars of perennial plant material. For example, latham is considered an heirloom raspberry cultivar. The cross for latham was made in 1908 at the University of Minnesota Fruit Breeding Farm, selected for evaluation in 1914 and introduced to the market in 1920. Genetically modified organisms, also known as GMOs, are not allowed in certified organic production. It should also be noted that not all marketing outlets or customers are accepting of GMO crops. Know before you grow. GMOs are created using a variety of methods to genetically modify or influence their growth and development by means that are not possible under natural conditions or processes. Such methods include cell fusion, micro and macro encapsulation, and recombinant DNA technology. Recombinant DNA technology can include gene deletion, gene doubling, introducing a foreign gene, and changing the position of genes when achieved by recombinant DNA technology. As mentioned before, GMOs do not include cultivars resulting from traditional breeding, conjugation, fermentation, hybridization, in vitro fertilization, or tissue culture. For example, scab-resistant ap apple cultivars came about through traditional breeding and are acceptable for organic production. Sweet corn cultivars containing the Bt protein, though, are not allowed in organic production because recombinant DNA technology was used to insert the Bt protein found in Bacillus thuringiensis to protect the sweet corn from certain damaging insects. Using tomato as an example, let me demonstrate how choosing your cultivar is an important decision. Response to environment can be viewed more than one way. It can refer to your production system or when in the season you are growing the crop. Tomatoes are a warm season crop and for the most part are traditionally grown outside after all danger of frost. But we have numerous systems for season extension, including hot caps, caterpillar tunnels, low tunnels, high tunnels, and greenhouses. And for each of these production systems, certain cultivars are more suitable. Tomatoes have two predominant growth habits, indeterminate and determinate. Almost all heirloom tomatoes are indeterminate growth, also referred to as vining types, meaning they continue to grow and set flower buds until frost kills them, sometimes achieving heights of over 10 feet tall. The newer cultivars tend to be determinate in growth, meaning they are shorter in overall height, usually 3 to 5 feet tall, and they tend to produce a crop in a much narrower window than vining types usually two to three weeks. Determinate types are also referred to as bush types. Overall yield is a major factor, but there are other facets that must be considered. Let's compare two tomato cultivars. Both average 40 pounds per plant, but one cultivar tends to produce a more uniform crop of large fruit. The other cultivar produces a larger number of fruit, but there is no uniformity. Size ranges from small to large. Depending on your market need, one cultivar may be more desirable over the other even though they produce the same overall yield. Tomatoes are usually grouped by maturity or days to harvest. Early season cultivars are usually much smaller and are more cold tolerant than later season cultivars, but they lack the full-bodied flavor and size and quality of later season cultivars. 
Main season tomatoes are the workhorses, usually the most reliable and productive. Late season tomatoes are usually very large, like the beefsteaks, but have the disadvantage of their overall long growing season. Tomatoes come in a rainbow of colors, but red is still king, although some markets have a strong demand for other colors like yellow, pink, purple, orange, white, and black. And along with an attractive fruit, other characteristics like improved flavor and nutritional value are important marketing considerations. One of the drawbacks to growing heirloom tomatoes is their lack of resistance to fusarium wilt and verticillium wilt, two very common and destructive soil-borne diseases. We now have a solution for this problem in several vegetable crops by grafting susceptible plants to resistant rootstocks. Most modern tomato cultivars, though, have resistance bred into them through traditional breeding practices. A note that resistance does not mean plants are immune, but simply that they are less likely to succumb to specific disorder than a non-resistant variety. The take-home message is to select cultivars that have the best disease and insect resistance package available for your production system. Post-harvest stability isn't something most growers think about until it's too late. In the case of tomatoes, they differ widely on shelf life, depending mainly on the thickness of the outer skin. Cherokee Purple is an heirloom tomato that has a beautiful purple-black fruit with an almost smoky tomato flavor, but it has a relatively thin skin that is easily damaged and a shorter shelf life. As another example, Yellow raspberries are relatively delicate compared to other raspberries and fetch a premium to offset the added care and risk a grower takes to grow them. Put this all together when selecting cultivars and you hopefully have found your niche market. As you will hear repeatedly, continue to evaluate each crop for its contribution to your bottom line and make changes when a cultivar is failing to fill your market needs. Winter cold hardiness is often more of a consideration for perennial crops than for annual crops. Perennial crops have to survive the cold of winter and for that reason attention to winter cold hardiness is important. As an example, most peaches grown in the Midwest are suited for zones 5 through 8, but there are few cultivars that are rated for zone 4. Reliance is such an example. Keep in mind that even though the tree itself is more winter hardy, an open bloom on Reliance peach is just as susceptible to frost kill as any peach. Spring frost is the main reason peaches are not grown as a reliable commercial crop in areas rated zone 5 and colder. One of the problems with the first super sweet sweet corn cultivars was their poor germination in cold soils. So a grower had to delay planting super sweet sweet corn cultivars until soils had risen to the mid 60 degree Fahrenheit range and instead plant a less desirable sugary enhanced type. Today, there are super sweet sweet corn cultivars that have been specifically bred for cold soil planting. There are many examples of seasonality within a crop such as strawberry listed here. June bearing strawberries set flower in late spring and produce one crop anywhere from late May to mid June. Day neutral and ever bearing strawberries can produce more than one crop in a growing season, but require more inputs to produce similar sized fruits. Quite a bit of attention is paid to cold hardiness maps, but heat zone is another very important concept to understand. Some crops perform poorly in hot climates, particularly, for example, coal crops, spinach, root crops, and raspberries. Coal crops and spinach tend to bolt in hot weather and for this reason are grown only in spring and fall in warmer climates. Root crops tend to develop a somewhat woody texture and taste in hot weather and raspberry fruits tend to become crumbly in hot weather when field grown. As pictured here, you can see that Illinois ranges from plant hardiness zone 5A to plant hardiness zone 7A. The northwest corner has the coldest winter temperature, and as a general rule of thumb, for every 250 miles south you move in the state, one week is gained at the beginning and the end of the growing season. Note the small microclimate in the Chicago area due to the lake effect, which in effect boosts the plant hardiness zone to 6A. Pictured here is a map depicting the general trend in number of frost-free days throughout Illinois. Note, there is an entire month's difference between the most northern portion of the state compared to the most southern.
We have already discussed determinate versus indeterminate growth habit of tomato, but there are another other crops that have differences in growth habit. Pumpkins come in a number of growth habits, ranging from the more compact bush types to the ground-eating vining types. If you are limited in space, the bush type may be more suitable to your needs. Beans and peas are similar in that there are freestanding bush types and climbing types available. The climbing types require some form of trellis and usually require more space. Tomatoes are a good example for differences in fruit size. The bite-sized tomato, which include the currant, grape, and cherry tomatoes, can be extremely time-consuming to harvest if you aren't harvesting them in clusters. Once you get beyond bite size, tomato cultivars are available in every size class up to beefsteaks, which can weigh in as much as two pounds per fruit. Most markets vary in the size of tomatoes clientele want. Some can sell small tomatoes and some can't give them away. The same can be said for beefsteaks. It is important to not invest significant inputs into one cultivar unless you are certain of its marketability. Regardless of whether you are growing in the field, a tunnel, or a greenhouse, keep in mind your space limitations. Plants have a three-dimensional space requirement that if crowded by another plant or structure can greatly limit the plant's quality and yield potential. Selecting the best cultivar for your space is the first step, but understand that there are more advanced techniques available to control plant size like dwarfing rootstocks, pruning, and trellising, just to mention a few. Variety trial reports are a good way to become aware of early production reports on newly released or coming soon cultivars, but even better is to take that information and trial promising cultivars in your specific production system and growing conditions. With a little search on the web, a number of variety trial reports can be found for fruits and vegetables alike. Shown here is the link to the Midwest Variety Trial Reports. Cultivars can vary greatly in their maturity dates. With many crops, cultivar selection across multiple maturity dates can be utilized for succession planting and harvest. Instead of making several successive plantings with the same cultivar, one plant date can be done with a range of maturity dates. For example, if there is sufficient market demand, there are enough fall apple cultivars to require harvest from late August to late November. A note of caution though, Days to harvest are usually based on where variety trials were conducted and may not necessarily come into harvest in the same number of days locally, especially if there is a zonal difference or unusual weather conditions. Pictured here is one of many harvest maturity charts available on the web for apples, brambles, grapes, and stone fruits. By way of example on how harvest date can vary depending on where the data was collected, this data for South Carolina shows John a Gold apple ripening on or around the second week of September. If you were to look at the approximate harvest date for South Central Pennsylvania in a chart provided by Adams County Nursery, you would see John a Gold in harvest the first week of October. That's a three week difference. The take home message is to adjust accordingly for other locations and trial locally for more specific harvest dates. Continue to track harvest dates to better pinpoint sales availability. This is the link to Adams County Nursery, which was referenced in the previous slide. Adams County Nursery is just one of many reliable growers of fruit trees for Midwest growers. Succession planning has somewhat been mentioned in previous slides, but the concept is important enough to further emphasize. The concept of succession planning is to plant in a manner that the crop trickles in as needed rather than all at once. Planting in this manner reduces the need for post-harvest storage because the crop is harvested as needed if planted correctly. There are two ways to succession plant, over time or over maturity date of cultivars. Sweet corn is a good example of a crop that can be succession planted both ways. Let's say our clientele has shown a decided preference for Providence sweet corn. You can supply Providence sweet corn throughout the season by planting blocks periodically over the growing season. Let's say your clientele just likes bicolor, but not necessarily Providence. 
Another method then is to plant multiple bicolor cultivars with different maturity dates so that as each cultivar matures, you have sweet corn to harvest. For perennial fruit crops, it is standard to plant a num number of cultivars with varying maturity dates to extend the harvest season. Presented here is a link to one of the many fact sheets provided by Appropriate Technology Transfer for Rural Areas, also known as ATRA. ATRA is a sustainable agriculture information center that provides technical assistance to farmers, market gardeners, and extension agents on farming topics by providing an online resource for sustainable agriculture and organic farming news, publications, events, and funding opportunities. Pieces should be coming together. You have been introduced to the concept of cold hardiness and heat zones for determining whether a crop is suitable to your specific growing conditions. You have also been introduced to cultivar specific performance data and harvest maturity data for selecting which specific cultivar is most suited to your specific growing conditions and marketing needs. Shown here is a fact sheet developed for Missouri vegetable growers on crop spacing, seed needs, and some nutritional information. This is a good example of a fact sheet that contains very useful information to growers outside the state it was intended for. Provided as a handout in its entirety is a vegetable planting guide, a fact sheet providing information pertinent to planting each crop properly at the right time. Color may bring the customer in, but taste and quality bring them back. Most fruit and vegetable crops come in a rainbow of colors, a trait that can be utilized to create an attractive and inviting market display. Maintain an active on-farm trialing program to provide customers with the best tasting and highest quality. But don't forget to mix it up with color if your market has shown demand for color choices. Interest in the nutritional value of fruits and vegetables has been increasing, in part because of recent findings on the high level of obesity and other diet-related health problems in children, and in part because of increased federal support of programs funding consumption of fresh and processed fruit and vegetable products. Seed companies and nurseries have many offerings with elevated nutritional levels, like lycopene-rich tomatoes to lower stroke risk. Growing cultivars with disease and insect resistance can reduce pesticide inputs and reduce risk of crop loss. The majority of pest-resistant cultivars have been developed through traditional breeding programs and are accepted in all markets. Genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, as already mentioned, are not accepted for certified organic production, nor are they accepted in all markets. If your market accepts GMOs, cultivars are available in sweet corn and summer squash. As an additional note, seed treatments are another option to protect crops. Seed treatments can provide both insect and disease protect protection. Conventional seed treatments are not permitted in certified organic production. Another selection criteria for a specific cultivar is its post-harvest quality, meaning how long can it be in storage or on the sales floor before becoming unsaleable. Another is how well it stands up to shipping. Thin-skinned or delicate cultivars have short shelf lives and do not ship well. One example already mentioned is Cherokee Purple Tomato. Cherokee Purple is very thin-skinned and is difficult to harvest without bruising and is often harvested with gloves. It has a shorter shelf life than other tomatoes and does not ship well. Then why grow it? Well, it has excellent flavor and if there is market demand, can fetch a premium price. Yellow raspberries are similar, and certain market clientele will pay a premium for the relatively scarce yellow raspberry. Good shippers tend to have durable exteriors and maintain their quality in storage. Shrunken to cultivars of sweet corn are a good example. Their kernels tend to be tougher and they stay sweet for a long time. Capturing a niche market means providing a specific product for a specific aspect of the market. The market niche defines the product features aimed at satisfying specific market needs, as well as the price range, production quality, 
and the demographics that is intended to impact. An example of a niche would be supplying ghost peppers to the hot pepper market, or supplying baby greens to the restaurant market, or supplying fresh produce to the local clientele. Maintaining budgets for each crops helps to allocate land, labor, and capital to the most appropriate use, but they also provide information to the grower on whether a selected crop or cultivar is performing as expected. There are a number of enterprise budgets available on the web for a variety of crops. In general, for organic crop production, the producer must use organically grown seed, annual seedlings, and planting stock unless a cultivar is not commercially available. Regardless of availability, organically produced seed must be used for the production of edible sprouts. Non-organically produced planting stock to be used to produce a perennial crop may be sold, labeled, or represented as organically produced only after the planting stock has been maintained under a system of organic management for a period of no less than one year. Plan to educate yourself. There are a number of sources for information about planting stock. Commercial catalogs are an excellent source of information, and research reports can provide unbiased information to support catalog claims. Make a point of attending programs for commercial growers. This is another excellent opportunity to interact with other growers and sales representatives. Visit other markets to see what other growers are producing and how crops are priced and displayed. And don't discount your own experience in production records and making cultivar selections. As mentioned already, commercial catalogs are a very good source of cultivar specific information. Many of the larger suppliers employ sales representatives who will work with you on plant material selection. Most have a web presence to make contact with a representative. The Midwest Variety Trial Report was created by Extension and University Research Stations from across the Midwest. The report comes out annually, showing results from the most recent vegetable cultivar trials. The Midwest Vegetable Production Guide primarily provides pesticide recommendation, but also includes limited cultivar recommendations for each vegetable crop and basic production information. The guide is updated annually and is available as a hard copy from your local Extension office or it may be viewed online at the address given here. As mentioned in the basic fruit production module, cultivar and rootstock selection is just as important in fruit crops as it is in vegetable crops. Cultivars and rootstocks differ in their cold hardiness, tolerance to heat, wet soils, and pest. Cultivars also vary greatly in harvest date. Careful selection of cultivars results in a successful succession harvest with no gaps or overabundance of crop. The nursery sales representative is an excellent source of information when choosing rootstocks or cultivars. On the web, abundant information is available on rootstocks, but keep in mind that nurseries don't grow all of them. You've been told that you can't grow everything. Well, nurseries follow the same rule. Do your research, then compare that information with what the nursery has available. You may not be able to get what you want immediately. A one to two year wait is quite common with fruit tree orders, so plan ahead. The next few slides are crop specific and demonstrate the choices that need to be made before you even start selecting cultivars. When do you want strawberries? If you just want one crop per year, then you want to look at production systems for June bearing types. If you want more than one crop throughout the year, you will want to look at production systems for ever bearing strawberries. There are several production systems suited for field, high tunnel, or greenhouse production, and each have recommended cultivars. For example, cultivars recommended for plastic production are better suited because they have longer petioles. First sweet corn cultivars were sugary types, designated as SU. 
They have all but fallen out of the market because they lose their sweetness rapidly after harvest. Today, the most common types of sweet corn are the sugary-enhanced, shrunken two types, and a combination between the two. Sugary-enhanced type, designated SE, have improved sugar retention, a tender creamy kernel, and excellent flavor. Shrunken two types, designated as SH2, are very sweet without loss of sweetness over time and are excellent for shipping. There are also GMO sweet corn cultivars available with the BT trait for resistance against corn or earworm and armyworm. There are cultivars available carrying the trait for herbicide resistance as well. There are a few rules specific to sweet corn when planting multiple cultivars. All sweet corn must be isolated from other types of corn to some degree or they lose their desired flavor characteristics and instead taste starchy. White cultivars will de develop yellow kernels if pollinated by a yellow type. To avoid these pollination errors, separate by a distance of at least 100 feet or planting date of at least 10 days. Tomato has been used as an example a few times, so you already know that there is a huge number of cultivars available to choose from. The newer cultivars have been bred with resistance to fusarium wilt and verticillium wilt, but many of the heirloom cultivars are susceptible to these soil-borne diseases. For heirlooms, grafting to a resistant rootstock would be a recommended practice if either disease is an issue. As mentioned before, make a practice of maintaining an active cultivar trialing program on your farm. Variety trial reports tell you how the cultivar performed at the research location, not your farm. This also allows you to produce a small amount to test on your market for customer acceptance. Trials should be planted and maintained just as the main production area, so they are treated equal. In a trial, you should maintain records on stand count, the date harvest started, marketable yield, percent calls, and any problematic pest issues. Once harvested, take note of clientele acceptance in terms of total sales. If the customer won't buy the product, there's no point in utilizing resources to grow it. When selecting cultivars, keep in mind that rotating crop families is a good way to reduce pest occurrence. Crop families refers to relatives within the same plant family. For example, within the solanaceous or tomato family, tomato, pepper, potato, tobacco, husk tomatoes, and eggplants are all closely related and share similar pest issues. In a proper rotation, a member of the same family would never follow another member in the rotation. A crop from a different family should follow in the rotation, say the onion family or the coal crop family, for example. Crop rotation is usually associated with annual crops, but rotation is employed in perennial crops as well. The rotation just doesn't happen as often. Because of replant issues, apples don't usually follow apple and peaches don't usually follow peaches. Some crops are better started as transplants. Commonly transplanted are members of the tomato family, coal crops, and many vine crops. Keep in mind production space and time needed for transplant production prior to field planning. Soil types are more suited to some crops than others. For example, carrots are not suited to heavy clay soils. The carrots will grow, but the roots tend to fork and become knobby in heavy soils. They are better suited to lighter soils. Brambles in general require uniform moist soils at all times, so sandy soils are more risky without an installed irrigation system. Rootstocks for tree fruit have varying susceptibility to soil-borne diseases, so care should be taken when selecting rootstocks for heavy clay soils. Full dwarfing apple rootstocks have a very limited root system and, like brambles, are not as suited to light soils unless irrigation is installed. As mentioned before, most seed and nursery stock suppliers maintain a web presence where you can order catalog or place an order. Another good way to make contact with suppliers is to attend specialty crop trade shows, which in general are held December through February. Listed here are contacts at University of Illinois Extension should you have additional questions related to cultivar selection.